If governance isn't being done carefully, that's when companies get in trouble. Hello and welcome to Off the Books, where we surf the uncharted waters of accounting, finance, risk, and wherever else the waves take us. This episode is brought to you by Workiva, the one platform that brings together financial reporting, ESG audit, and risk teams so they can work together in the cloud, not in an overcrowded conference room. My name is Steve Soder, accounting enthusiast and Diet Coke aficionado. Looking forward to debiting a great conversation and I'm so happy to have you with us. Joined, uh, joining me, as always, is Catherine Sai. Catherine, could you please introduce yourself for the fine folks at home? I'm not an accountant or Diet Coke aficionado, but I like uh, venti soy chais and asking questions, so I'm here to do some of that. And I understand we have a very special guest with us today. Uh, indeed we do, Catherine. We are so excited to welcome Jonathan Johnson, Chief Executive Officer at Overstock.com. Uh, I'll point out, during his time at Overstock, Jonathan has served as General Counsel, President, Chairman of the Board, and has been deeply involved in Overstock's efforts to incubate and deploy blockchain technology, but... He's also been a CFO and even clerked for the Utah Supreme Court. Uh, I got to be honest, I feel like I might need a nap just having gone through that list. And you also worked together before, right? Uh, we sure did. I am a proud Overstock alumnus. Thoroughly enjoyed my chats with Jonathan as I was collecting his signatures for our SEC certification process. I can also add, not Jonathan, to make you feel uncomfortable, that almost without exception, you were the very first person to provide your comments on our 10 Q's and K's. So, Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Steve and Catherine, thank you for having me. It's uh, good to be surfing together. <laughs> we love it. Um, so, Jonathan, let me just lead off. Um, you know, in my opinion, and I would add firsthand experience, Overstock is a really well-governed company. And I feel like you've had a front row seat from nearly the beginning, actually, Um why do you think, why, why would you say that Overstock has been so successful in this regard? And maybe what lessons did you learn along the way? Well, it's not been without some uh, bumps and bruises, but I think from its inception, Overstock has had a strong commitment to good governments, governance. We've maintained independent board committees. We've tried to hire strong and qualified outside directors to be on our board and always had a strong audit committee and audit committee chair to oversee our financials, uh, very good compensation committee to oversee how we, you know, the programs we run as a company for compensation. And then uh, we've got a great nominating a corporate governance committee that's recommended good directors. We just added a new director last week that was, you know, came through our NomGov committee was interviewed by the full board and uh, it has been great. I, I will say that uh, when we have, you know, I had some twists and turns and things and early in our history, 20 years ago, we had a restatement and I think that helped us refocus. And I think, you know, anytime you make a mistake, you work hard not to make it again. Uh, we review our charters annually, look to see what best practices are, look to see what new rules have come. And, you know, 2022 was a was a year of plenty of new rules and plenty of new things to think about being in the upcoming proxy. Um, the other thing I would say that's important is we've learned to value having a diverse board of directors, diverse skills, diverse experiences, diverse perspectives and backgrounds, and then we really work hard to make sure that all are prepared for the meetings, that we get the materials out plenty in advance, and that people have time to review them. Uh, and then our our chairwoman today does a really good job of making sure each director's questions get asked and answered, that all are participating. You know, it doesn't do any good to assemble a diverse and well-qualified group if they don't feel like they can participate and dig in the way they want to on the topics they're best able to. Was there anything on your first day as CEO that you felt you wanted to do right away with governance, or do you feel it was in a pretty good spot? Uh, you know, I think we did, when, when I became CEO, I think I 
knew we needed to add to our board. It was lacking some things. I think it lacked someone with marketing expertise. And so within a year, uh, we had Barbara Messing join the board. She's the former chief marketing officer at Walmart, the current chief marketing and people experience officer at Roblox. She's added a great perspective. Uh, you know, we were missing a person of color. And uh, we were missing people with IR background. And so, you know, within that first year, we added William Nettles, who great experience uh, working in investor relations and doing deals, uh, also happened to be uh, a person of color, helped round out our board. And then, you know, that those were kind of day one things I wanted to do. But this year, you know, three, three and a half years into it, uh, we recently added Joanna Berkey, who's the Chief Information Security Officer at HP, with the growing emphasis on privacy. It was important to me to find a person who knows that, you know, a CISO who knows the information security space, but who views it from the perspective of a business person. And uh, when I met Joanna, uh, it was clear she was just that person. She wasn't, you know, the who with the old adage to a person with a hammer, everything's a nail. You know, sometimes you get someone who has expertise and they view everything through that lens. Joanna's got great expertise in information security and information strategy, but she looks at the business holistically too. And so I think we've we've really upgraded and augmented our board with with her addition just last week. One of the things that I think is interesting, Jonathan, that I'll just point out is that if you think about a, maybe that the, the typical aggressive CEO, hey, I'm hard charging, I want to do this my way, and I don't want the board to get in the way. What's interesting to me, and I think notable, is you've taken the opposite approach, which is to say, hey, govern me, provide the guardrails, provide the insight that I need as the CEO to, to kind of stay aligned. Um, I, I just find that really unique. I guess I don't have a question other than that seems very different than I would expect a CEO would want a lot of autonomy and a lot of freedom to do whatever she or he felt like was needed to be done. Well, I, I think that's a fair comment, Steve. And I, I do think board members need to be thoughtful that, you know, one of their primary responsibilities is to hire and fire CEOs. But I also think in between those two things, they have a responsibility to support the CEO that they've hired uh, and make that person successful. And I think they do that by the phrase I heard recently was nose in but fingers off, uh, being really aware of what's going on in the business, but not trying to be CEO for a day, one day each quarter or two days each quarter as the board meets. And so that, that's how the Overstack board is really uh, operated, and it's made me rely on them more. You know, there's that old adage, it's lonely at the top, and a CEO is really making the hard decisions. Uh, easy decisions don't come across my desk because other people are making those decisions because they have the autonomy to do so. And on the hardest decisions, you know, Yes, I rely on my colleagues on the senior leadership team, but I also will talk to board members to get their thoughts, particularly if it's in an area that's their area of expertise. And so I really view the Overstock Board as a group that helps me do my job better while it represents the shareholders' interests. We've been talking about governance, which is an important pillar in ESG, the hot topic of the day. And there's been a lot of focus on the environmental side, the social side. How does governance fit into Overstock's overall ESG goals? And do you see governance growing in importance in light of some recent headlines at companies that shall go unnamed? Yeah, well, look, I think ESG governance is the uh, ultimate letter in that acronym. You know, it's last on the list. Uh, and it's not last because it's least important. I think it's very important. Um, if governance isn't being done carefully, that's when companies get in trouble. That's when 
unscrupulous management teams can can do wrong by the company, by the shareholders, by other stakeholders. And so, you know, governance has been a vital part of Overstock's ESG efforts. It's always front of mind. We've had a strong commitment to governance from the beginning. Um, the committee meetings, the board meetings are not perfunctory. They're fulsome discussions. Um, and we're continuing to find ways to improve governance. You know, although, Steve, as you introduced me, I've had a lot of different hats, but one of them uh, was being a general counsel. And I so I think from my perspective, uh, governance was kind of what I cut my teeth on when I started working at public companies. I've also been a CFO, and so I know financial disclosure is got to be correct and important. So I've cut my teeth on that. And so I think having worn those two hats before wearing business hats, you know, as the president of the company and later as the president of our investment arm, uh, before becoming the CEO, has meant that uh, I put uh, uh, an emphasis on governance. And as, as you commented, Stephen, even today as the CEO, I try and get my comments on the 10K first. You know, when it goes, when it's emailed out to the entire executive team for comments, I like to get my comments back first, in part to send a message to everyone else who's copied on that email. If this is important enough for the CEO to read through this long disclosure document and, you know, comment, not just on the new wording, but on some of the old stuff too, then it's important for everybody to look at it and comment on it. Another one of my practices is when the rest of the people send their comments, I usually send a private email to each person as they comment, thanking them for their review of this important disclosure document. I just, to me, that sets a tone at the top that disclosure and governance is important in overstock. Is that different from what your predecessor did? Uh... You know, he read it. Um, even then, I tried to be first. There's a little bit of a competitor in me. I, I like to get, you know, I like to keep my inbox clean so when stuff comes in, it's not. So it may, may be a little bit different, uh, but it's it's something that's part of, it's part of my DNA, and I've tried to make it part of Overstock's DNA uh, as the CEO of the company. Well, there's more to come in our conversation, but we're going to take a quick commercial break. How is a financial reporting team better than a dad joke? A dad joke can tell you what to call a busy accounting leader, but it's not going to tell you why. Really good financial reporting teams can pull together reports that tell you what happened last month and even tell you why. They just don't always have the time to get to the why. That's where Workiva comes in. Top accounting and finance teams are using the Workiva platform to automate financial reporting, from financial statements to board reports, from 10 Qs to S1s. Spend less time copying and pasting numbers and more time telling the story behind the numbers with data your auditors can trust. See why accounting and finance teams love Workiva at workiva.com slash accounting. That's W-O-R-K-I-V-A dot com slash accounting. So what do you call a busy accounting leader? Overtaxed. Ugh. Why? So... Jonathan, speaking of governance and, and in light of some of the breakdowns that, that that you've seen recently, as you read the news, are there takeaways that, that perhaps you and other chief executives are thinking about right now that maybe weren't on your radar before? And I don't mean to make every corporate scandal an issue of governance and ESG, but I can't, and actually, especially as you've just described it, I can't help but connect the dots to where Today we think about ESG and you know environmental and social terms often, but then you see some of those breakdowns, and then immediately what wasn't an ESG issue might suddenly become an ESG issue because it largely was a failure in governance. But but what are you thinking about now that maybe you weren't before? Well, I'm certainly thinking about what the SEC is asking companies to do. I mean, I look at the climate control proposals, uh, climate rules that's been proposed and. I frankly think they're an overreach of of, of authority. Uh, you know, I know people may disagree on that. I think most rules, I think most laws should come from the Congress and not from the executive branch. But, you know, we're looking at 
how we can comply if all those proposed rules become rules and how it will impact competition among public and private companies. I think it's going to and I give a leg up to private companies. I look at uh, privacy disclosures. You know, there's been rules out there about, you know, when there are breaches, what needs to be disclosed. That's one of the reasons that uh, Overstock was thoughtful in our most recent board appointment and uh, had a chief information security officer who's sitting in that chair today at a great technology company uh, join our board. Um, so I think there's... There's lots going on. And then, of course, I think that when there are scandals out there, and we see a lot of scandals in the crypto world today, and, you know, Overstock has been involved in the blockchain world more than it's been involved in the crypto world. But I think some of these things were predictable uh, as agencies thought it's easier to uh, rule make by enforcement rather than rule make by writing rules. I think most people, certainly not all, but most people want to color within the lines. They want to obey the rules. But when you don't know where the lines are and lines are really set up by enforcement, that's catching people coloring and then drawing enforcement lines, you know, you're regardless of where the coloring has happened sometimes. Well, do you want to dig into that a little bit? Because, you know, it, it occurs to me that your perspective here, I think, is really, really valuable um, and relevant, you know, given everything that we've seen happening. And, and you're right, it's largely uh, related to crypto, cryptocurrencies, crypto exchanges. But you were actually a big part of some of the early efforts to actually lay out those lines and to lay out some of the regulatory groundwork. What's your take about what's been happening recently? Yeah, so Overstock was, I think, the first major retailer to accept cryptocurrency when we, when we began accepting Bitcoin in January of 2014, so over nine years ago. And I remember going back to Washington, D.C. shortly after that on non-crypto-related business discussions on the Hill, and every staffer, every member of Congress, every agency staffer I talked to wanted to talk about crypto. And what they really wanted was jurisdiction over it. Uh, how could their group have jurisdiction over this kind of newly emerging technology? Um, and I think that it wasn't, there's not been enough clarity around it. The way the IRS treats it as a asset and not a currency, whether crypto was under SEC control or uh, the commodities the commodity rules. You know, it's it's been confusing, and so I think we don't have a history in the United States of uh, regulating new technology well, and I think when it's not regulated well, either be explicit that it's going to be in a sandbox and we'll figure it out as we go and give some leniency or set up rules ahead of time so people can, again, color within the lines correctly. Uh, we create an uh, environment where those that are willing to be fraudulent can do so. And that gives a black eye to a whole industry. Um, so, I mean, Overstock is not really a crypto-focused company. We do have a number of investments in startups that are advancing blockchain technology, and that blockchain technology underlies cryptocurrency, but it's much broader than that. But yes, you're right, we were involved early and tried to get some clarity on rules and didn't happen, and I think it's that's part of what led to where we are today. Oh, thank you. Very interesting. Well, really quick, Steve and Jonathan, were you in conversation with the SEC at the time, back when Oversock was accepting Bitcoin? Oh, uh, yeah, we were. I mean, we talked to the SEC about Bitcoin. We talked to them about security tokens that would trade on the blockchain. And in fact, Overstock was the first company to issue what was called an STO or a security token. Uh, we've since retired that. Uh, but Overstock was kind of 
the vanguard of that pioneer effort um, for some of those things with the SCC. Fascinating. Well, it's about that time to get to our closing question of the day. Steve, do you want to ask this one? Well, do I and, well, I, I can ask the question because I've actually, this is a legitimate question, not even a lighthearted one, although I'm hoping, Jonathan, you have a lighthearted quip at least, but what do Catherine and I need to do to eventually get a seat on a board as part of retirement? I didn't say this, but actually, as I looked through your LinkedIn profile, just to be sure I had you know, kind of all the history, I note that you are currently serving, and it feels like a dozen boards, actually. So I feel like you're the perfect person uh, to whom we should ask this question. Well, I've, I'm only serving on one other board than Overstock right now, but I've served on a lot of private company boards as Overstock made investments in these, in these companies. And one of the happiest days of my life was when we outsourced the management of that investment to a venture capital firm. And the day that deal closed, I resigned from seven boards of directors. And that was was a big load off the shoulders. But, you know, when you, I know a lot of people kind of view sitting on a board as uh, easing into retirement or part of retirement. I think that uh, the best way to get on a board is to be a, uh, an active member of a management team where you're in the trenches and doing the stuff. Um, you know, as I, the other board that I sit on, we're actively recruiting people from the C-suite because they're playing the game. They know what's going on. And so, you know, will some of us on that board stay on that board after we retire from the day job? Perhaps, maybe. But I think the best way to get on the board is to have value you're bringing today. And a lot of times that value is uh, you're in the game at an adjacent industry. Uh, you have expertise. You know, I think of Steve, you know, you, you would be great on an audit committee uh, of, of a lot of, for a lot of companies given your background. But I think the higher up on the management team you are in your company, the more appealing you are to be sitting on the board of another company. Sounds like we need to create a C-suite for both me and Catherine with the express purpose of recruiting ourselves to a board somewhere. You have the qualifications. You just need the recognition. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Jonathan, thank you so much. I know you are very busy, have a lot going on. Very kind of you to uh, to drop by and talk to us. Steve and Catherine, thank you for having me on. As always, it's nice to chat and you make a conversation feel easy and casual. Well, after that awesome interview we just had with Jonathan Johnson, a quick note on some content and programming update. We are actually going to take a break here, expected to come back till the beginning of June. Catherine, could you use a break? Of course. I want to re-listen to some of our past episodes. Maybe I'll leave you a note on YouTube, too. <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like after the conversation we just had with Jonathan Johnson, as well as the huge episode that we have talking about the Bernie Madoff docuseries, I think we could all take a deep breath. Thank you, dear listener, for surfing along with us. Please subscribe, leave a review, and tell your buddies if you liked the show. If you're watching this on YouTube, please leave us a note in the comments or feel free to drop us a line at offthebooks at workiva.com. Surf's up and we'll see you on the next wave.